So the last presentation will be from Erin. And Erin approached me about a topic, the labor rights of yoga teachers and whether unionization may help yoga teachers uh, gain, I suppose, better health care, better benefits, higher wages. As it turns out, this was all before COVID-19 occurred. And once COVID-19 occurred, we started to see that Aaron's concerns and worries uh, were actually, in fact, very valid and were playing out in reality. But Aaron has a plan. She has uh, a number of different ways in which we can work together to change the yoga industry for the better and to find a brighter, more optimistic, more compassionate, a more unified future for yoga. So uh, let's hand it over to Erin for the final presentation uh, of the evening. Thank you, Dermot, and thank you for all of your help this semester. You've been so supportive. Uh, David is going to help me with my presentation tonight uh, so that I can move through it a little bit easier than on my own screen. So I will be using yoga teacher cues like Next and change. <laughs> I want to thank a lot of people too for their support in getting this um, work done over this time, this past two years. My family, my friends. I think Aaron, can can we stop? I think we need more volume a little bit for some people. Okay, well, I'm not quite sure how to do that. Is it okay if I move a little closer? Um, sure. Can you hear me any better if I talk louder and come up closer? Is this okay? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. So hopefully you heard my thanks to everyone and I will get started. We're going to stay on this slide just for a moment, David, because just um, in referring to what Dermot just spoke to, I have a little bit of a disclaimer um, because before I begin, we all know things are shifting daily in the landscape of this current economic crisis. And as I am following the yoga industry quite closely, I want to say that I'm very proud to be a part of this community and all of the um, all of the work that we're doing around this community and the industry itself. And as my original methodology was to look at the pathway to solidarity in our current state of the industry right now the path is quite treacherous and unstable, but it is still gripping. And, it, and the direction it is moving, I find it inspiring. The direction yoga professionals are taking is, is innovative. And it gives me hope for the future for this industry to be a leader in a revolutionary change. Okay, David, we can move on to the first to next slide. So as you can see here and uh, read the year 2020 is not turning out to be a good one for the American yoga teacher. A few reasons. The first being um, January 21st, there was a mandatory change in labor legislation in most states. In California, it is the, um, the AB5 legislation that reclassifies workers and making independent contractors all um, employee status which affects teachers greatly. Um, and then also the COVID-19 pandemic crisis um, with the sudden and massive teacher unemployment uh, rate. So we can see that there is no stability in times of status quo, and there is also no infrastructure for uh, American yoga teachers in times of woe. So I would like to say though, out of all the industries that could potentially create foundation for a different way of coming together to do business during and after this unprecedented crisis, yoga can lead the way and yoga teachers can find a collective voice. Okay, next slide, please. David. Change. Okay, great. Change. <laughs> Okay, so what, no, no, the one before that. Yes, change, no, the, yeah, the one after, the one that says change. Yes, there we go. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so what the yoga industry needs is a different working model to create equity and in income and job security for teachers, a radical change that will support fair standards for ethics in practices, a common curriculum, economic quality, and accountability for the environment. Unionization will benefit teachers and studios, but only if the partnership is good for both. And with the popularity, the resources online and through the collective force of yoga teachers, the yoga industry has the power to create a new business model entirely to empower their workers, their community, the industry, and perhaps the world. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, but first a little bit more about how we got here. A few of my colleagues have talked about this and how America has, or, uh, has adopted uh, yoga as a Western uh, fitness practice, but I'm going to trace it back just a little bit more. Um, how did asana become synonymous with fitness? And according to Mark Singleton, um, it is the most influence on international physical culture through the 1920s and 1930s. And this body was, change the slide please, the YMCA. <laughs> The YMCA actually came up with this very common phrase that I think every single yoga teacher, including myself, has ever used, which is mind, body, and spirit. This is actually a phrase that was developed by this organization in the late 1800s to create an international sort of a climate for a physical reawakening of the humankind. Okay, next slide, please. So we're going to look at a few yoga entrepreneurs just in the, the line of bringing it into um, a physical fitness realm. And that is first with uh, Swami Kuvalyananda, who actually uh, reputed the YMCA and decided to develop a rigorous system of postural yoga in India. And he established research institutes and created a system to employ it in schools. And he actually built a national brand, which I'll be using a lot of the word brand to popularize yoga. And then uh, Sri Yogendra, uh, he actually was the first to bring and establish the yoga into the United States as asana, as a physical practice, and did the first uh, yoga asana demonstrations in America. And Krishnamacharya, as we have heard of um, with being the um, father of modern yoga, brought Ashtanga brand here, and his um, two disciples, Indra Devi, who brought yoga to Hollywood Elite, very famous Hollywood Elite organization for yoga practitioners, and Sri um, K. Patabi Joyce, who popularized the Ashtanga brand first in Encinitas in Southern California. Okay, change the slide, please. And then we can also uh, recognize uh, branding yoga through lineage from the Yogananda Ghosh and the um, Bikram lineage that Misha spoke of. Okay, but enough of that subject. Okay, please change the slide. So actually a little bit more about Bikram because he actually um, did commercialize and capitalize yoga, which is the direction that we've been moving since the 70s into the 80s. This whole era of globalizing yoga brands to create competition. And as we spoke of also, and Morgan spoke to about the neoliberal capitalist model that yoga industry has fallen into and very much a part of that influence was Bikram Choudhury and he actually attempted to copyright yoga postures which led to reforms by the government of India to actually take ownership of the yoga postures and um, I have to give a little shout out to Dr. Christopher Miller um, in recognizing our discussions of the pizza effect which has occurred here in this case Next slide, please. So we're looking now towards what is the new brand and that is the yoga teacher. So since, uh, because of a lot of movement, uh, thank God, the system or lineage model is out and the guru has become a four letter word. <laughs> So, and these um, economic trends that teachers have become a part of, the neoliberalism and the competition and the social media influence, we can see through these marketing campaigns of social media, Instagram, and other online teaching pl platforms, 
um, that teacher has become a very important component in projecting and um, influencing the population on yoga values, uh, sequences, postures, and philosophy. But how have teachers slotted themselves here into a category of workers who are supposed to believe in this field that for the love of the practice and the altruism that we claim as selfless service or SIVA, that that is more important than personal health and equal economic status. Because yoga teachers are the lifeblood of the industry and they are the gateway to this information flow, empowering teachers is so essential, uh, but it must come from spiritual principles, not Leo, uh, not neo capital, uh, neoliberal capitalist models of what we consider to be our choices or this competition. Okay, so for the next slide, please, David. Let's look at where we are now. Uh, just a review of the state of the industry that's been touched upon. Uh, the 38 million Americans as uh, active yoga practitioners is quite remarkable. And this was in 2016, so I can only imagine that it has grown quite exponentially since then. Um, and it shows that there is a lot at stake, that Western yoga's growth is unrelenting. Okay, so if we can move to the next slide, please. So um, more um, just a breakdown of the financial infrastructure of what has created this $16 billion a year and growing industry. And I did get together with a financial friend who's a little better at numbers than me and did some projections based on the 2012-2016 findings to project the yoga industry pre-pandemic numbers being at about uh, $24 billion a year and growing within all of these categories. Okay, so the next slide, please. So why is it then that teachers are not finding full-time work? Only about 30% of yoga teachers can claim teaching as their primary source of income, and the output of energy is far more than just one hour of instruction, which is all that usually most teachers are paid for. So if the teacher hours are broken down, they're actually coming out far less than minimum wage. And there is this saturation of the teacher training um, models and influence that has come in through the yoga studios that I can't really get too much into, but there is a saturation and the ratio of now currently of the teacher um, trainee to the teacher themselves is two to one. So there are two teacher trainees for every one yoga teacher that's been certified, which does saturate the market. However, there are a lot of, of teachers that say uh, that they are just in it for uh, fun or they're just simply trying to increase their knowledge of yoga and not really so, so much to have a full career pathway. But that just goes to um, the, the point I wanna make of the need to increase standards for certification and also unionization for full-time teachers. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, there is one body in um, a working body that is actually uh, available to support teachers, but it is mostly as I've found in my research to um, accredit and create standards and ethics for a a teacher training programs and studios to adhere to. There's not so much of a um, of a, an opportunity for teachers to unionize or create a collective voice through this organization. It does um, have benefits, partner perks, which is just basically discounts on goods and services like yoga mats, yoga clothes, yoga jewelry, and more things that you can buy, creating this need for consumption. And then there's online workshops through also Alliance Partners. Now, since the majority of training tra teachers and schools are certified through Alliance, I think it's important to consider, you know, working with their standards and working hand in hand with um, this organization to create more efforts on supporting yoga teachers. Um, so uh, moving on to the next slide, please. So I do wanna say though, as of yesterday, um, so things are moving quickly in this world, 
have to say on top, the pandemic relief efforts for yoga teachers did come out through Yoga Alliance Foundation, and they are offering some pandemic relief um, funds for teachers who apply. So I did want to just point that out because I think it's important right now that we do see where there is support and um, and I will be keeping a very close eye on this. <laughs> okay, so the next slide is um, more legislation has uh, more about this legislation. So the AB5 and also other states have reclassified um, workers and this has actually created quite a pushback in several industries and the yoga teaching industry as well. But from my research on the legislation and the bill text that I read, I actually find that it is um, a positive and it is actually designed to support some of the um, things that I'm trying to uh, accomplish in this thesis uh, with stability for work and access to workers' compensation, benefits, health insurance, and basic protection rights of the teachers. And you can see where this um, neoliberal capitalist influence comes in. We've pigeonholed ourselves into believing that we have some sort of choice as independent contractors to work for any studio, go and come as we please, make our own money, but really we don't have a choice. We're sort of um, indebted to these studios and afraid of them in fear of not being able to make ends meet. Um, but anything that defies this seems like it's going to actually inhibit us when I think it's actually designed to support us. As most studios not only have reduced the rates of pay to an hourly comp compensation as low as minimum wage, but now they don't even secure or they don't even offer any sort of full-time work for their teachers as employees because they don't want to have to be able to pay into the benefits. Okay, so the next slide, please. So in, in that line of thinking, I had uh, looked at the sag after union model as a model for um, supporting both the studios and the teachers, because a lot of single owner owned or small women owned yoga studios can't afford to, you know, supply benefits and full-time work for all of the teachers, and that's understandable. But if you look at a union model like the Screen Actors Guild um, had set up, you can look at a very similar set of circumstances that it was formed under, a Great Depression, the studios cut from work, and then also um, the guild was in line with academic theories and social conflict. Here we are, an academic and then in a social conflict. And so it also had these star players that it could draw on for support and to bring more, um, you know, notoriety to the cause. Um, so this feeling of um, powerlessness is sort of lifted by this collaborative voice, but also, um, and I want to move on to the next slide, because as we look at this model of benefits and how we can support this as uh, as as workers who work for several different businesses, even if we're of an employee status, you want to look at this model as being a really amazing sort of collective um, cage that stores all of the pay and information in one union location and then it is actually dispersed or you can actually meet your requirements for your health insurance benefits, your pension, and all of these um, different sorts of benefits throughout unionization. So it's, it's a really great way to, um, to consolidate all of the finances in one place, which is actually an outside body from the Screen Actors Guild, but they do have an amazing benefits plan, which I'm sure could be um, implemented into the yoga teacher community with the healthiness of our, of our, of our job description. Um, so uh, there is, I also want to say, a, a movement called at Unionize Yoga. Notice it's an Instagram handle. They did use the platform of Instagram to, to gain momentum in their following and have been written up in the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and all over the place, and actually supported by Bernie Sanders as well in their movement um, to work up uh, with uh, yoga works in New York to create a better um, environment for teachers in New York with yoga works. But since then, in the past week, yoga works New York has um, has uh, 
said they're not going to reopen any of their New York studios permanently, but they're still moving on with their efforts. Thank, thankfully. Okay, so we're moving on to some other uh, other um, things that have come up in this current situation. Um, one that is necessary to point out is this brave new online world. And it has actually benefited yoga teachers in creating autonomy and opportunities for self earning and actually spoke with a yoga teacher in Puerto Rico about it this morning at 530 when I was taking his class about how this has given teachers finally this voice to make their own money, create their own systems and to find a community around them. And I think it's actually showing teachers, wow, I can actually make money at this. And I don't have to charge people $25 a class, um, which makes for more accessibility for minorities and people who can't always um, afford those sorts of things <laughs> like fitness. Um, also, um, just to look at um, some of the things that that Morgan was speaking to, um, even though it's a profiting off of the body and it's profiting off of images, it's also relating more to a lot of different demographics than regular um, media would relate to with commercials. But at the same time, with commercial advertising, I mean to say, but at the same time, this also, and, and sorry if this is a little um, not cohesive, but I just had this thought like two days ago. <laughs> but um, this actually is another reason to make it a vital to collect a body of, of teachers, of workers to negotiate on behalf of, of teachers. So when you're looking at online, at content, it's similar to commercials, it's similar to advertising. You absolutely need to have something in place to protect teachers and their images and the way that it's used and marketed and the way that the industry makes money off of it coming going forward. And also like actors that they get residuals from the repeat use of image. So if there's content online that's being used and bought and accessed over and over again, that teachers should be able to, you know, profit off of that as well. Okay. And so then moving on uh, to, um, some, just some additional options for change that I wanted to explore in this um, current um, context. Uh, so um, cooperatives was one model that I think is quite interesting. Um, just a, a look at restructuring and rebuilding yoga studios as community businesses um, with um, financial equality for community members and board members and teachers. And it's an amazing model that actually I find um, a little bit um, uh, works with our yoga philosophy. Actually, a lot works with our yoga philosophy. It traces um, as far back as uh, the commune roots of American yoga counterculture, ashrams, and better yet, it even sort of traces back even further to the forest dwellers of the Puranas. So these uh, c communal philosophical ideas can lead to a new way of restructuring a business model to benefit teachers, students, business people, and the communities they serve. And then staying here on this slide for a little while longer, just to talk about something else that I find important, when you're talking about changing a system, you have to really look at like the principles of that system. So how do you change a world we live in, in a system of politics that is broken? Well, I don't actually believe that you can. You need to create a new system entirely, a system that is based on spiritual principles and these principles that must be rooted in our society as a universal practice that I think can work in this field. Um, and there's nothing else like it in a field like yoga to be able to perpetuate these ideas, but also an education, of course. But um, this is actually not my original idea, but it was inspired by the work of Yogi Russell Brand and the great late Chuck Chamberlain, who was a member of a anonymous worldwide organization that is highly successful leaderless collective of people from every walk of life and for over 85 years with proven results it functions administratively through spiritual principles so in examining how to create compliance in a large group of people we have to look at love and fear 
And through fear, we can manipulate. And our current system operates through this modality of fear to manipulate, intimidate, and they become abusive hierarchies. And if we follow traditions out of respect, it is much the opposite of adhering to them as rules through fear. So when we uphold traditions because we love them, we love the very principles that they embody. And through this, we create this transmittable consciousness of love and understanding. So when organizations are created on active principles that are rooted in love rather than fear, not only are we finding a way to evolve into a higher collective consciousness, but we are also creating new patterns on the planet for change. And then of course, last but not least, well, hopefully, <laughs> there's always a revolution of the peaceful kind, of course, a satyagraha, truth force, the yogi way, but what we've seen from you know Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., these, this principle does work, and that is the peaceful kind of, of revolution from boycotting nonviolent resistance and keeping the voice for change loud and strong. So with my conclusion on the next slide, just to review um, the imperatives uh, to form a yoga workers union that is separate from but working within the alliance standards because they are already good standards of certification and then in within an infrastructure based on spiritual principles and then with the governance within this board of directors or the union would actually be the siva the service the principle of service and so it would sort of rotate like, you know, a, a true democratic model might. And then I have to say again, with enthusiasm, the necessity to understand this as a mechanism of change. And this change will not come without a cost. There will be much to debate on how yoga is a means for pacification and the biopolitics of what we discussed earlier and that yoga is meant to keep people passive and subservient, but it is not that at all. When we saw those nationalist agendas that came in as yoga in the early uh, part of the century, along with the military training and the postural design and sequencing and the powerful philosophy of Satyagraha, truth force, <laughs> I love saying that, truth force, then we can make a solid case for yoga to be a catalyst for countercultural revolution and change. If we go backwards from pop culture to countercultural, we can be the leaders in alternative models of doing business and business models that are our dharma. Union, communal, and cooperative resonates at the core of the very philosophies of yoga doctrine. So with that, I'll leave you on the next slide just for a moment to reflect. And I want to thank David again for running my slides for me and everyone for being so supportive in my life. Just in case you didn't hear that in the beginning. Erin, thank you very, very much for really an outstanding presentation. So many different elements coming together. Uh, what really strikes me about this is how practical it is, how cooperative it is how you want both sides to to come out of this uh, studio owners practitioners uh, entrepreneurs everyone can benefit from this uh, approach to really bringing back in a way a spiritual essence to this idea of the union and i think that yoga is in a great great place to to deal with that to introduce that and to change perception really in america of what a union is there's really a image problem in america with this because of a lot of successful propaganda and it's simply not the case this is the only way we can really see workers in any field uh, look out for themselves but there are several questions 
And uh, I would like to invite, if Amy Osborne would like to uh, uh, send her questions, if you would like to ask them directly to Aaron, because you have some very insightful questions, I want to make sure that uh, I, I don't know if I can do them justice, because you are actually a studio owner, so maybe you, you can uh, jump in, uh, Amy, and give us a little bit of insight. Uh-oh, called out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm interested in, I guess I had two points I threw up there. I can't um, follow all the chat, so you'll have to fill me in. <laughs> I will, no. Um, so as a studio owner, I would love to make all the teachers employees, but we find that we have a hard enough time making ends meet um, because, and I largely attribute that, so my good fight in the yoga industry is about how do we change the public's relationship to yoga to increase the market value so that people are willing to pay 30 to 60 to $70 for an hour instead of $10 or asking for free classes. Um, free yoga, especially in the virtual age, is very prominent. And I'm afraid that that devalues um, when we return to an in-person class setting, will people want to pay for yoga if it's free online right now in a lot of cases? So just interested on your thoughts on um, the market value of yoga, how we might be able to help the public value yoga more so that then studio owners can hire the instructors as salaried people or give them benefits, because I would love to do that, but it's quite a conundrum. Um, so did you find anything about market value and maybe ideas around how we can get the public to pay more for yoga to see it as a valuable resource so then our yoga teachers can be better supported? It's a really good question because part of my research was trying to look into yoga studios and I, I teach at three studios. One is corporate and two are small women-owned businesses. And so I can look into what you know they're doing during these times, especially which is unveiling, you know, what is really happening in the field uh, a lot. Um, but I think it's hard to really look at market value of any company when you don't have any sort of data. I don't have records of any yoga studios and their earnings and their profits. I don't know what yoga studio teachers and yoga studio owners are actually making. I have just the basic yoga alliance survey information which isn't enough to really draw conclusions on and so the reason i didn't really approach it in that way and because i'm giving a lot of like love and compassion for the yoga studios it's not like this hierarchy of you know we want to like make all this money and you you can't but it's more of uh, of like how do we change these ideas underlying everything in our entire society of finding more equality in earning which is hard yeah. to have that conversation with people in this anywhere it really is like saying well you don't need to make so much money <laughs> you know yeah. why do you need to make so much darn money you know yeah. and so until i <laughs> until I could actually say like what a yoga studio is mm -hmm. earning or anything. I can look at yoga works and obviously they had a unionization effort against them because they were making a lot of money and their teachers weren't. So, yeah. and same with core power, you know, so you see in corporate yoga studios that have gone public that where they can see the numbers and the discrepancies in earnings income and teacher pay, you can see that there are efforts of movement against these organizations to create some, you know, relief and benefits. But I think that's why I also like the Screen Actors Guild model, because I think that model of unionization doesn't hold the studios accountable for the health benefits of its employees. It actually puts that into the efforts of the union. So the union is accountable for it. It doesn't take away teachers having to work for multiple studios, have retreats, be able to do anything that they are already doing. It just creates this body to collect all this money information so that it can use that as a collective bargaining power to create better benefits for everybody. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah. I think mom and pop yoga shops versus franchised models are totally different. Um, 
but you're right. It's a secret what we all make or don't make as <laughs> studio owners. It's largely a heart-driven uh, industry. So um, I thank you for the work, and I think all of us here are about motivating the public to increase the dollar that they put onto yoga. I think you know we deserve to earn a living for this work, um, and I, I I think unions are a great way. Mm -hmm. If we revisit the Yoga Alliance survey too, there is actually a lot of information in there that the highest amount of dollars paid for yoga in the industry are for classes and that people are willing to pay more money. I don't know what that's looking like after this is all said and done, but that was in the survey that people right. actually are willing to pay more money. But then we have to look at, you know, equality and accessibility. So there's another issue. Absolutely. And I can go on and on and I won't. So if anybody wants to ask me questions, <laughs> feel free, real life. So thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Uh, thank you for being such a good sport. I just <laughs> thought it would be very interesting to see you guys have this conversation. Um, you know, very interesting for us uh, from the outside looking in. Uh, Sarah Harrington had wanted to know uh, how yoga works closing down in New York. Has it had any impact uh, on the ground on unionization? Is there what's happening there? Uh, does Aaron, do you have any updates on the situation? Well, hi, Sarah. Sarah actually laid this in my lap over a year and a half ago. Thank hey, you. Hey, Aaron, what's up? <laughs> Great job. Woo. And then she moved to New York. <laughs> yeah, I'm watching it from here. I've been following you. So I haven't really been able to keep up with what Unionized Yoga is doing at the moment. I know I'm still getting their posts from Instagram, but they haven't sent me any emails. So I was relying on that to sort of keep me up to date. But I know that they were also working with core power teachers. And that was the referral that they got to work under the umbrella of the machinist union. So I think mm. that they're still definitely moving forward with unionizing and the efforts to unionize as yoga teachers. And it's something that I'm so, so grateful is happening because any efforts to create change is like really vital right now. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't have a lot of updated information as of last week. Yeah, it's happening all very quickly. Thank you. I was just curious about that. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, Thanks, Sarah. Great to see you. Uh, Aaron, uh, one final uh, point, which I think is, uh, I can't recall if you deal with this in your thesis, but Francesca in the chat makes a very interesting point. And we have a, you know, there's a similar situation in academics with PhDs. You know, there are far more PhDs now than there were, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Hence, getting jobs is fantastically difficult now. Um, the same problem is happening in yoga, it seems. Um, with 200 hour teacher training, and then being able to train further teachers. Do you think there's a problem with the teacher training model that needs to be addressed in order for this unionization to work? Or do you think that's a separate issue? I know, I mean, it's a part of the, the capitalist model of making money, so it's definitely a problem. You know, you're not looking at churning out like quality teachers as much as earning a profit off of people. And that's, you know, not every yoga studio is doing that but I definitely know that it is a form of income, a huge source of income for yoga studios to increase revenue. And it doesn't necessarily guarantee jobs either, but it does guarantee a saturation of yoga teachers in the market. But it's also, once again, going back to like, how many actors are there in Los Angeles? Like you could throw a penny and hit an actor. You know, I, did, I got my undergraduate degree in theater and drama. So it's like, you know, what do you, what do you do about that? You can't, you know, oppress people's desires to learn, but you have to work it into the system just like anything else. You have to work it in with the standards and the ethics on the back end. You have to make sure there's compliance. You have to make sure there's um, a core curriculum that's adhered to. It can't, you can never control what people, you know, want to do or how studios want to earn money, really. You can only, create some sort of an infrastructure on the other side for serious people who truly want to teach. You know, I don't think every single person who wants to teach yoga is going to be able to just go out and teach yoga. And I think it's really, it's really hard to, you know, to put any limitations on, on trainings in that way. I think, uh, thank you, Francesca, for the brilliant question. And Erin has, again, a brilliant answer. Um, 
amazing answers, amazing presentation. Just if I were a yoga teacher, I'd be wanting to talk to you right now, uh, very seriously about this about this issue because um, something has to has to give. I think from Amy makes a good point too. The huge corporate yoga studios um, they need to be challenged. I feel it's something that we're hearing now uh, from a lot of the cohort is that the idea of corporate yoga uh, is not working for sustained spiritually orientated serious practitioners and might even be damaging uh, as as morgan pointed out as grace pointed out uh, as numerous presentations have suggested so we are at a very serious crossroads i think unionization is a is an excellent way to go especially the manner in which you present it so rational so logical and um, so beneficial for all concerned so a true yogic presentation a true yogic experience uh Aaron, thank you very very much and congratulations I now have the honor to present Erin with her award, Shraddha. Faith, belief, trust, commitment. You have demonstrated your continual commitment to yoga as a spiritual practice with sincerity, with faith, as you demonstrated in your presentation today and throughout the whole program. You are dedicated to yoga as a profession, beyond it just being a spiritual practice as a profession and its scholarship. This time, you mentioned this time, this world of change that we're living in, this inst instability and woe. And you have demonstrated this commitment to Sangha, to keeping up your practice, to being committed to your Sangha, supporting other teachers, calling, us all to look at the value that yoga teachers bring, offering us a social justice model. You also appreciate it, as I've known you throughout the program, you, you continually to appreciate the ancestors and show commitment to the teachers who have come before, which is so important as we continue this practice of yoga, remembering that, that which has come before that has brought us here. The Yoga Sutra, in the Yoga Sutras, um, in Pada 1, verse 20, it says that practice must be pursued with trust, confidence, vigor, keen memory, and power of absorption to break the spiritual complacency. So it's this idea of trust, this practice, this commitment to your practice, to your sadhana, that really has illuminated what we experience as this beauty and this positivity that you continue and this deep dedication and commitment that you continue to strive for and fight for in yoga. So it comes from this essence of faith and devotion, which is the essence of love. And we honor your love of yoga today with Shraddha. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm really emotional right now because this whole experience is emotional, but that was very heartfelt. I really appreciate you saying that. It made me think of a saying, um, faith without works is dead. <laughs> You have to, you can believe as much as you want, but you have to actually put in the effort and the action. Um, so thank you for saying that. That means a lot to me. And I, I really am so grateful for this experience. This is really changed my life, really changed my life. Thank you.